Okay, so then let's start. Everybody, um, it's my great pleasure to have uh, our guests from Berlin, uh, from the Berlin here, Jonas, uh, who is going to present a bit, uh, about Click, which is uh, the new web protocol, as many of you may know. And uh, it is, uh, in a sense, it's a double pleasure because he's, uh, he will give us uh, like an overview of the last conference. Uh, Little bit of one and a half years of research, right? And uh, some of which was uh, last week. Uh, and uh, so um, it's actually a very high range talk we have today. So, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, welcome. So, uh, as you've heard already, I'm Jonas. I'm going to talk a little bit about Quick. So, um, maybe we should get started by who actually in this room knows Quick? Does it, who has heard of it? Let's start with that. Who would say he knows Quick? Oh. <laughs> well, maybe, okay, three people maybe. Okay, so uh, maybe we, I should introduce the protocol. Um, it's a relatively new transport protocol. It uh, supports multiple streams um, and it's UDP based so that you can send it over the general internet and you don't have to have the problems of uh, new protocols not being adopted. Um, and on top of UDP, um, it implements reliable data streams and congestion control. So features that you know from TCP, but now you have them in this new transport protocol. And uh, it also encapsulates encryption uh, just to optimize for latency. We'll see later how this works. And why is Quick relevant? Well, in 2020 already, 75% uh, of Facebook's internet traffic was Quick, and other hypergiants also widely adopted Quick already. And um, it uh, with this multiple stream support, it has very beneficial uh, features for uh, the web. So maybe if you have a website, you can uh, load content in parallel and it, there's no head of line. Here. So um, the example we're going to use here is uh, you want to stream a very famous, well-hated, beloved uh, Christmas song uh, from youtube.com. And uh, so of course you don't want your colleagues to know that you listen to this song. Uh, so you want encryption, so quick is good. And then, of course, you want it as fast as possible. Um, so why is quick fast? Well, if you have your um, standard TCP and TLS setup, you have multiple handshakes. So you have the TCP handshake that takes at least one round of time. And then on top, you have the TLS uh, handshake, which takes up to um, two more uh, round of times. And uh, with quick, you just have both in one, so the quick handshake uh, replaces the um, transport and TLS handshake. So you can uh, reduce the range of times that are required by one to two. And how does it look in your browser? Well, um, oh well, you cannot read it here in the room, um, but <clears throat> um, so uh, nowadays the, the, your browsers uh, often have this network tab where you can uh, check how fast um, the websites are delivering content and what you should be able to see here but it's also below in the slides um, is uh, that the tcp handshake takes uh, 10 milliseconds and then you, the tls handshake is following which takes 42 uh, milliseconds so until we end up with 52 milliseconds and with quick you could have this in uh, 24 milliseconds so you have like um, half of the time to just have the connection set up and afterwards you have the normal data transfer which could also be faster with quick um, so most websites, for example, uh, YouTube, uh, do not only consist of HTML, but they also contain CSS for styling, background, colors, and stuff. And uh, you have images, and then you also have JavaScript, and finally you have your video that you want to load. And with Quick, uh, you can fetch all these files. Uh, you can multiplex it, so you can use the different streams and then you load everything in parallel. And if you have packet loss, um, you only um, only the, the one um, stream that is affected by this packet loss is blocked, but the other files, for example, the images you're loading are not blocked, so they will pop up on your screen already. But with TCP, you did not have this feature as there's only one reliable um, data stream. Um, so let's look at the um, handshake that <clears throat> we have talked already. Uh, I've talked already about. Um, I said it was very efficient and it, it embeds TLS. <clears throat> so um, 
So uh, the handshake consists of uh, an initial message, which is sent by the client to a fake server, and then the server reacts with an initial and the handshake message. Um, and the server is limited to send a maximum of three times the amount it received from the client. So um, there's uh, this limit which is imposed by the standard and which might seem just arbitrary right now. Um, what's uh, the main part um, uh, that, um, that's in the size of, that's increasing the size of the responses from the server um, is uh, the TLS certificate. And um, actually what you should, <clears throat> actually what you should see uh, when you connect to a website um, is uh, you should have this 24 milliseconds handshake, but actually if uh, you stick to the standard, this is the reality, you actually load YouTube uh, slower because you want to stick to this amplification limit. And then uh, you have to wait for more data from the client and then the server can send additional data so you can send the entire certificate. So actually you're not uh, speeding up the handshake, but you are even slower in this in those cases. And um, what's the main reason um, for this? Uh, we ask ourselves uh, if this was just a single problem or um, if that's a popular problem. Well, we checked the Tranker Total 1 million list. Uh, we connected to them with HTTPS and quick and collected the TLS certificates. And in uh, the results, uh, the result were 272,000 um, quick supporting domains. And uh, here you can see uh, how we connect to different to those different servers. Um, uh, on the x-axis, you see the um, quick initial size we use. So you can variate it, but you have to send at least 1,200 bytes. And um, <clears throat> you can also see the typical uh, sizes used by um, popular browsers. And what we can see is um, we have these multi-RTT handshakes, which we've already seen for YouTube. Um, so it's not optimal. And also we, what we can see is that um, two thirds of the cases, we have amplification. Um, what is amplification? Well, um, UDP um, based protocols are often um, used for amplification attacks because there is no handshake in general. And then you don't very, so you, there's no verification of the source address. And so you can use it for amplification. And this works by just sending a small package to a server, for example, DNS, and then the server answers with a bigger um, package. And uh, for example, typical amplification factors of DNS are 28 to 54 times. So with quick and the specified three times limit, we should be safe, right? <clears throat> yeah, so, but we still see this amplification during complete handshakes. Um, so there are two more cases which you can uh, see on top, which uh, occur very rarely. And these cases are is the use of retray, which is a mitigation for uh, those uh, for DOS attacks, basically. So um, you uh, the server reacts with a retry um, uh, message, and then the client uh, has to use the token that it received in that message to reconnect to the server. So you add one round trip time, um, but you don't add load on the server already because you don't store state um, of this initial connection. And the second one is the optimal handshake, um, which also, as you can see, uh, occurs, but very rarely. So most of the implementations don't behave um, properly, I would say. <clears throat> so the main reasons, as I already said, uh, is the certificates and more specifically, uh, the large certificate chains. And what you can see here is um, uh, quick services and uh, popular um, certificate chains. And um, in yellow, you can see the median certificate uh, size, uh, median leaf certificate size, which is reached. And in orange, uh, you see the maximum leaf size, that, leaf size that we have observed. And what you can see on the right side with these um, dotted lines, is the anti amplification limit that is uh, used by those that is applied by the initials sent by the uh, Chrome and Firefox browsers. And you can see that um, <clears throat> often uh, these limits are already exceeded by other certificates that you send that you have to send uh, during the handshake. 
Um, so now uh, what you have is that the effect an effective um, production setup depends on how well your TLS certificates are designed. So for example, what can you do? Um, well, sorry. <clears throat> um, so what you could do is you could use more efficient um, certificates. Uh, for example, you use uh, some different signing algorithm like um, ECTSA or uh, instead of RSA. And um, so what we've seen so far is amplification during uh, complete handshakes. So the client acts like a normal client, like a web browser. And there we observed amplification of up to 4.4 times during the handshake. Um, but now we should ask ourselves, what is actually happening if uh, we have incomplete handshakes? So <clears throat> if the client only sends one initial message and then uh, it does not react any further. Um, so, and exemplary, we, we checked this with all Facebook IPv4 servers. And uh, what we found is this result. Um, so we grouped uh, the different uh, Facebook services. Um, and you can see that, for example, Instagram and um, WhatsApp, I think, yes. And WhatsApp um, have high amplification factors, well above the three times limit that we already know. Um, and uh, then we talked to Facebook and they uh, said, yes, this is a problem, we know about it. And a little bit later, uh, we got our first uh, Christmas gift, uh, which is actually, uh, they fixed it kind of. So now they exceed the limit. Um, so they amplify only five times. Um, so it's still about the specified limit, but um, yeah, only three times. Yes, question. And the dotted line is the three times limit? Yes, the dotted line is the three times uh, limit. So uh, what can you do to improve the situation? Well, as I said, uh, use a better signing algorithm. You can also enable certificate compression. So certificate certificates you have to send uh, are just smaller and then decompressed, but it's currently not supported um, by TLS libraries. Um, and then uh, what uh, Facebook did not consider, uh, I would say, is that um, the recent packets, so if you have, uh, if the client does not react anymore, the server assumes the packet was lost and just resends it. But um, you also have to account uh, for these bytes in the anti amplification checks. So um, this likely did not happen for the Facebook servers. So maybe on uh, lossy links, this is the this three times limit is a problem, and uh, if you have even small certificates, um, it will only be possible to try one reason, so only one full packet loss from server to client. And uh, now a Christmas gift for you. Uh, well, during the IETF um, hackathon, we just designed this uh, service. You can input your uh, domain, and then you will find out how well uh, does the quick handshake work. Uh, so the cases you have seen uh, before. Um, so so far we have talked about active measurements; um, those were great. But uh, now, what uh, can we do actually with passive measurements? And uh, we use Internet background radiation um, to do that. So I don't think that all of you are familiar familiar with what Internet background radiation is. So a quick reminder, uh, you have the internet, so a slash um, zero, and then you have a network telescope that's part of the internet, so just also a different address block. And uh, then you have scanners, for example, that just scan the internet, so they can send packets all over the internet. And if uh, the address they scan uh, is our telescope, we also see those packets. Uh, and then there can be, for example, this configured um, IP camera that is supposed to send uh, its video stream to your local NAS, but instead it's misconfigured and sends it sends the its packets to the internet. And if the IP address um, that is uh, configured in the device uh, is in our in the address range of our network telescope, we also see those packets. And um, third, <clears throat> we have um, attackers. And um, they um, try to exhaust the state on uh, popular services. So, for example, uh, you can try to uh, use up all ports so no new connections are used. Um, so, you randomly spoof a source address. And if that source address is um, 
within the IP address range of our network telescope, the packets will also end up uh, at our telescope and we can observe that. <clears throat> so uh, the beauty of this is that it's not intrusive. You don't uh, send any additional packets and you just wait and sit and uh, see what you can observe. And uh, what we can see is, uh, <clears throat> is uh, the scanners that I've talked about. So you can see a lot of packets that try to connect to web servers because they uh, try to connect to port uh, 443, which is commonly used for HTTPS and, <clears throat> and quick as well. And uh, what, you can, uh, what you can see here on the right is uh, scans from TU Munich and RBTH um, Aachen. Uh, and you can just identify them by uh, the IP address and see how often uh, and how long they take uh, for scanning. Uh, so next, what we did is we um, grouped uh, the responses, so actually what uh, was the attack traffic into um, attacks. And we did this uh, by applying a certain threshold. So we uh, said, hey, we want to have at least 25 packets in, in an attack. Uh, this attack should uh, have a duration of at least six seconds, and we should observe at least 0 0.5 packets per second. Th this is a more or less um, well-known uh, threshold. And what we found with this is uh, 2,905 attacks in a one month time span on uh, only 394 IP addresses, but more than half of the uh, target IP addresses are attacked only once. <clears throat> And often uh, what we found is that uh, there's not only uh, quick attacks, but at the same, at the same time, TCM, TCP or TCP and ICMP attacks occur. So uh, the servers are attacked on multiple protocol levels, levels and not only <coughs> using one protocol. And uh, we also saw that the main attack targets are uh, hypergiants, for example, Google and Facebook. And for these, we also saw a lot of traffic in our network task. And then we tested if these attacks actually have an effect. And uh, the largest attack that we observed is around the range that you can see the arrow here, um, <clears throat> which is um, around 10,000 packets per second. And uh, we performed our test uh, on a server with uh, 512 kilobytes of RAM and uh, in 128 CPU cores, so quite a powerful machine. And still, if you send uh, a lot of connection requests, the machine uh, is only able to answer 26% of the requests successfully. And um, if you turn on this retry feature I talked uh, about earlier, you can handle all of these requests at the cost of an additional round trip time. So the retry option works. So now we have analyzed the text, um, but uh, I think um, now I want to look into uh, hypergiant infrastructures and uh, what we can learn about um, the actual deployments uh, using this back schedule. And uh, to do so, we should understand, uh, <clears throat> we should understand how a typical hypergiant deployment might look like. So there will um, be a lot of uh, load balancing. So the first opportunity to do this is at the DNS level. So if a client requests a website, for example, youtube.com, um, it will receive an IP address um, that uh, is the first opportunity for the hypergiant to do the load balancing. So choose an IP address that is close to, to the client location so that it can serve the content quicker. And then, <clears throat> and then uh, the client uh, will send an HTTP request to that IP address. And then at the infrastructure of the hypergiant, it will pass through multiple layers of load balancing, so a layer four load balancer, um, so meaning on the UDP uh, TCP level, so uh, for example, um, based on ports, or maybe in the future using um, quick. And then uh, last, it is uh, also load balanced uh, um, on the application layer, um, so your request uh, will be forwarded to the proper server, uh, for example, a YouTube server, in case you requested YouTube, or a Google server in case you requested the search. Um, so in the following slides, I will refer to um, honor deployments as deployments within the autonomous system of a hypergiant, 
and automatic deployments to, um, as um, deployments that are outside of um, those autonomous systems. So, for example, in the network of your local um, internet service provider, let's say Deutsche Telekom AG, and uh, then they have like a cache there or this um, load balancing infrastructure to serve uh, the content directly from your ISP and not pass through the internet into the autonomous system of um, the service provider. And uh, now we will look uh, at some traffic features and we will try to uh, find offnet deployments using, <clears throat> using these traffic features. And what we found is that um, Facebook um, it did not enable packet coalescence. So in Quick, you have this feature that you can send um, two packets, um, <clears throat> two packets uh, in one Quick packet actually, and uh, Cloudflare and Google instead do this. So maybe you can use this feature to um, distinguish between um, Cloudflare and Google servers and Facebook. So <clears throat> we have already seen that incomplete handshakes cause these resends. And um, now I also want to introduce um, connection IDs. So Quick is uh, not using, is not relying on the ports you know from UDP and TCP, but instead it uses connection IDs. So during the connection setup, one connection ID for each site. So one connection ID for the server and one connection ID for the client um, is um, negotiated. And um, we will later use these connection IDs uh, to do some nice stuff. And um, <clears throat> um, if an attacker um, sends those spoofed packets, uh, he cannot uh, respond to them because he does not know the content of the packets that is that are sent by the server. So they can only perform uh, these incomplete handshakes. And uh, that's also what we observe um, at the telescope. So we also, Get the we see the resends and we can also see the recent intervals. And if we just plot them, um, we can see that uh, so we can see here different um, different peaks for different hypergiants. Um, for example, for Facebook, you can see that um, after 0.3 seconds there's the first peak, and then again after 0.6 seconds, and then the um, intervals double each time. Um, so what we can observe is um, we can see the um, retransmission timeout that is initially configured, and we can also see that it doubles each time, so there's exponential backoff active, and um, we can observe the same for Google and also Cloudflare, but the configuration is a little bit different for different hypergiants. And by just counting the peaks, we can also see how often those packets are retransmitted, and as I said earlier, those uh, retransmissions Cost uh, the exceed um, cost um, cost the cost the violation of uh, this anti amplification limit. Um, now we will look at the um, server connection IDs. Uh, we will look at them in the in the hexadecimal representation. So just from left to right, and um, this is what you can see here in those graphs. Um, on the x-axis is the position position in the uh, connection ID and then the y axis is the value, and more specifically, um, how often a certain value occurs. And what we can see is that specific values occur um, more frequently than other values. And what we found is that there's actually information encoding. So here's our second GIF from uh, Facebook. So in their implementation of Quick, uh, they uh, declared what information is actually encoded there. So there's uh, version information, there's a host ID, there's a work ID, process ID, and uh, we can now use this information to analyze their deployment. <clears throat> and um, additionally, uh, what we saw is uh, Cloudflare also does has this behavior, so they also have some information encoding, but only in the first um, byte. And uh, we now will use this information to fingerprint um, hypergiant deployments. And this information, like the host ID, would also be suited for um, low balance. So when we do this, we can very reliably um, detect uh, Facebook's <coughs> off-net servers from the um, backscatter that we used. Um, so we have like a true positive rate of one. And if we optimize a little bit 
um, we get to a false positive rate that is very low. So um, we can very reliably predict um, offnet service using just this um, SCID information. So just this information encoding. And this will likely apply to other hypergiants as well. So um, you have already spotted it probably on the slides. Uh, there on the right side, you have the host IDs. And actually what we found is that the host IDs are individually um, given to each uh, layer seven load latency instance uh, for on-net deployments of Facebook. So what we can do is we can uh, connect a lot of times to different Facebook IP addresses uh, using different ports uh, to reach uh, a lot of different uh, layer seven load balances. And if we do so and uh, <clears throat> show uh, and cluster um, the IP addresses um, by shared host IDs, so um, a cluster is formed. If at least one host ID is shared between those IP addresses, we can detect 150 clusters. Um, most of them have the same size, so 22 nodes. And what we found is that they all are within one slash 24 IP prefix. And um, we also found that each IP address um, forwards traffic to each load balancer. So if you want to measure um, a single um, cluster, you just have to measure one IP address and you don't have to scan the entire um, IP address range. And uh, additionally, uh, this is again an active measurement, but we already observed like 19% of the host IDs in the, in the backscatter of one month. So in the future with more backscatter, it will be likely possible to make more of these observations um, with passive data. And lastly, you can do a simple IP um, to country mapping. And uh, what you will then find is uh, here on the x-axis are different countries. On the y-axis, how many hosts uh, we observe within um, one cluster. And what we find is that in Asia, we have in general more um, layer seven load balances, while Europe, and North America, and South America have significantly less um, load balances. And with that, I want to um, quickly conclude. Um, so for the first part, um, <clears throat> we saw that um, quick can actually reduce latency, but often uh, inefficient handshakes are in place, and um, the entity amplification limit is often violated by those implementations. And um, to mitigate this, you could enable certificate compression, you could use a different signing algorithm, um, you can do packet coalescence, um, to just improve the handshake, so the setup time. Um, then in the second part, we saw that quick attacks are present, and they are often uh, combined with other <coughs> attacks, and we saw that the retry option is a quick way uh, to mitigate this. And uh, last, we saw uh, that passive measurements could be used for offnet detection, and that server connection IDs allow for detailed insights into server deployments, and um, uh, this information uh, encoding will in the future likely be used um, not only uh, for us researchers, but actually for the service providers to do load balancing. So they will use, uh, for example, in the case of Facebook, the host ID uh, to forward traffic and no longer ports. So they will also look into this and into these connection IDs to forward traffic. And with this, you can uh, always find uh, more details in these three papers, which have apparently been ongoing for one and a half years, if I got this correctly. And um, for that, thank you and open for questions. Any questions? Anything to quick? Yes. Do you have any idea why there are so many low balancers in Europe compared to North America? Um, on the, yeah, yeah. Why there are so many in uh, Europe than in North America? Yeah. Well, the difference in general is not that big, right? For different countries. I thought you also said that it's no, no. It's it's only in Asia. Sorry, maybe I uh, said it different. But uh, in Asia, is not the definitely exception, right? Perfect. Yeah, in Asia, Korea is the exception, and uh, yeah, in Asia, um, it's uh, likely just because of the uh, large population um, size 
and there's not so many locations um, to put load balances to serve the content to, to the users. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I assume you did process measurements in 1994. Are you planning to do also similar stuff with Active Um, Good question. Um, so, Active Measurements uh, would very well be possible, but uh, for IP um, v6, uh, network telescopes uh, are still not so common. So, yeah, let's see about this. Maybe. Maybe a follow up question on that thing. Uh, with this technique of Identifying the uh, natural IDs would that be made easier, maybe? I don't know. Maybe I understood it wrong. What would be, what would be made easier? Uh, to like, scan networks, uh, even if they use Android 6. I don't quite get it. Okay, maybe I. Okay. <laughs> maybe I'm... So you can maybe look into the packets off. and you can see these patterns. And this uh, works with IPv6, IPv4, um, okay. because you just look at the payload. Okay. Yes. Why is it that network telescopes with IPv6 are so uncommon? So that it would be very uh, more easy or... um, The problem is that the address uh, space is a lot larger. So to see a significant uh, part of the, the okay. traffic, you also allocate a lot of this. I think, but uh, maybe it's also it's infeasible to scan the whole IPv6 address space. So there's no one that does that. So you can't just put your addresses somewhere and expect uh, the scanners to find you. But for IPv4, you can easily just scan all addresses. So yeah, it will find this. Question about uh, <coughs> these. Um, 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 Connection IDs and the layer seven load balancing. Can we think of any alternative way of doing um, um, layer seven load balancing in Quick without using the connection IDs? Oh, uh, so I would actually say this is more uh, layer four load balancing actually using these connection IDs because I would consider Quick in this case the transport protocol. Mm -hmm. And uh, could we think of other options uh, to do load balancing besides? Um, the connection IDs, well, you can always do it um, statefully. Uh, you can already use these, uh, the given uh, layer four properties like the ports, um, but it will always have problems with quick because during the connection, uh, one port, for example, can be used for multiple um, quick connections. Yeah, and there's a problem. For the, the, the model, I mean, the report is basically uh, the model is behind yeah. the port. Right. So the, the part can change while the connection stays the same because it can do yeah. handovers between that as well. And that also, but, uh, but uh, and I guess the more current uh, problem is that you have checked many connection okay. and connections on one port. Connections yeah. on one port. You can have both. <laughs> uh, yeah, both is true. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, um, so this load balancing using using these connection IDs. Um, is um, very nice because you don't need state. You just encode what target you have, but uh, you don't need to keep state on these load balances. So that's why you want to. Yeah. 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 Didn't we observe that Google doesn't encode anything in there? Yes. Did change by now? Um, I'm not aware that that changed. Uh, well, you cannot see anything here, but it's very similar. So they don't have any encoding in there. And actually what they do is uh, they just echo you back the like, So yeah. they echo you back the connection I said initially by the client. And yeah, that means they either have to keep state or they are not using quick. Like, yes, and they uh, likely um, keep state, yes. Says something about how valuable um, in transparency is for Google. <laughs> well, you can also be like intransparent. Uh, for example, in this cloud layer case, you have just these two uh, uh, level values. Mm -hmm. um, but afterwards, we don't know what is encoded there, and we can uh, not encrypt it, decrypt it. Sort of so there will also be information like on the host yeah. you for the host. If you, I mean, you have quite a number of bits, and if you, um, if you use some sort of random pattern that is not colliding, not likely to collide, you could probably also um, use this for for 
low balance in the right. You should assume that the edits are actually random, you just slice the address space and yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, if you, um, you, you, I mean, you, you, you randomly assign the, 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 the bits somehow and then uh, keep some, some significance pattern in there yeah. so, so that the load balancer can actually uh, um, recognize it. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Interesting. We don't know how Facebook like that we know about the server and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> My reaction. <laughs> but it's a very detailed look. So you can basically see the clusters, um, how they are composed, <laughs> how large they are. Yeah. It's quite a lot of information. Any more questions? Maybe a question more to Rafael. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, what we, I mean, what we observed is a lot of um, um, a huge systematic uh, scanning in, in TCP. Mm -hmm. uh, do you already see stuff in quick? Can you? Yeah, I just forget the data. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you can imagine first, and I don't want to put it in five minutes. <laughs> so, it's not next, the next thing to come. Yes. Um, what people actually do to misuse quick uh, in the in scanning. There is quick on the right, right? Yes and no. There is, <laughs> there is a quick implementation of the port, right? But it's, and then, so it's not really finished, right? Mm -hmm. no. and, and it only, I think it only supports quick without the friction. That works as well. <laughs> yeah, because the, the, the library that was used, the encryption that there was a big problem. <laughs> so I can't. Uh, but it was implemented by someone who uh, was involved in the standard development. It wasn't in the last It wasn't in the quick check. Yeah. yeah. So, but clients usually can't see quick without the encryption, right? So, well, it's the client is the right. But then you can't update the servers because they're yeah. clear. <laughs> The wish list of the of the class was uh, basically uh, yeah someone who has a little bit more experience in embedded programming please take over my words. So <laughs> yeah, that one was cool. Uh, yeah, but it was that is the quantum. Yeah, and it's quantum. This is quantum. That is you can that is used for slide there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I felt like I saw one. I mean, I thought it was a bit of a. So, if anyone wants to do that, better quick. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to work. <laughs> <laughs> At least we have a better quick. <laughs> No more quick questions? Why is it so hard? That's a good question. Um, but you look at TCP or UDP, they seem much simpler, just like to implement and quick. Uh, well, it's, it's yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like for your traditional transfer protocols, it's more like layered, you do one thing and this you do well. But for quick, it's like, oh, I want to do everything because I want to be efficient. And that's making it a lot more complicated from my point of view. And you can also get a lot of a lot wrong with these implementations from reading the RFC because it's um, uh, not so well written. So it's also uh, quick design has that's been more traditional people, right? It's uh, then in, uh, 
in traditional uh, transport things, that's not also also my impression. Right there. Uh, the, the crowd is a little bit different. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no more question, and we can give us there.